It's a pleasure to introduce today's presenter um, of historic Delhi arch architecture, Lisa Tessier. Lisa is a professor in the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She and her family moved to Delhi in 2007. Her husband, Dr. Jack Tessier, is also a professor of science at SUNY Delhi. They truly enrich our campus and local communities. Lisa started at the college in 2008 as an adjunct faculty while her children were young and began teaching full time in 2012. Lisa also taught at SUNY ESF and then at Capital Community College in Hartford, Connecticut, before moving back to the area to be closer to family. Lisa has hosted walking tours of Delhi on numerous occasions. We are grateful she is a part of this year's virtual reunion and homecoming, and know you will enjoy her presentation. Thank you. Oh, and uh, happy birthday, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking about historical there, the birthday certainly brings time up to, to mind. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are really excited um, for, uh, for this presentation. I'm very thankful that you're um, spending the time to talk about this topic with us today. And I'm going to go through some slides and then um, please feel free um, at the end, I'm going to be saving time for you to ask questions. Um, there's also a chat box and you can enter questions in as we go as well, and we can come, come to them at the end. Um, so we're starting with two views here and I, a lot of the research we do looks at historical images and maps of the community. Um, and we're looking at a lithograph from 1887 um, and a view in approximately looking at the same hilltop um, today, uh, you can clearly see we have a lot more forest on that hilltop than this 1887 view. Um, and when we go through the different places, we'll look at some images that are historic and then some from today um, as well throughout the presentation. Um, the village itself was incorporated in 1821 um, and the town was incorporated before that. Uh, and we're gonna start looking, we'll start at the college. I'll tell you a little bit about this research project. And then we're gonna start at the college and look at the history a little bit, a micro um, bit about the college. And then we'll look at Main Street close to the college and then walk down Main Street towards 28 where 28 goes over towards Oneana. Um, so that's sort of the path we're gonna be walking on um, virtually uh, here today. So this project and the research I'm going to be sharing is really um, based on a lot of partnerships. So uh, for about eight years, um, I've been doing a service learning project in a history of architecture class um, at SUNY Delhi. And it's been built through partnerships with the Historical Society, Delhi Historical Society, local historians that have partnered with us to share their expertise. Um, the community members that own some of the homes that have given students the chance to go through their homes to see the architecture and experience it. Um, the Delaware County Historical Association has a wonderful, wonderful archives that we go to and use. And then a, a donor who has um, gifted things to the college to use for this research um, project. So um, just wanted to acknowledge that what I'm presenting is not all my work by any means. It's been built through partnerships with our students and um, with all these wonderful partners. So um, what happens is each year we select a number of um, structures in the village to study and uh, the students study them, um, again, working with the community and doing research. And then in May, the students present the results of the research um, back to the community in a walking tour. Um, and it's been a really wonderful experience. The feedback's been positive from the community. Uh, they get to learn about buildings that they didn't know about, and the students get to learn about the community they're spending time in as, as students. So um, that's just a little bit about the project. Um, and so we're gonna start and just conceptually, I think a really good place to start here is why did Delhi grow here? What was significant in um, in this region that led to Delhi's growth. 
And if you were all here, I would just kind of call for your answers. Um, and I, I guess in this case, we'll do it sort of as a rhetorical question and you can answer in your mind and then we'll go through some, some thoughts. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we saw that lithograph and we saw how uh, lumber was an important resource that we had available in this area. Certainly a strong foundation in farming um, with dairy and I think, um, I think uh, cauliflower was an important crop. Um, I see I have some things in the chat coming in too. Um, yeah, so Kari's going to manage the chat there. Um, and then, of course, it was, uh, you know, Delhi was deemed the county seat. And so we'll talk and look at some of the courthouse structures um, that were in this region. I got my cursor to work here. So we'll come back and look at some of those buildings as well. Um, it's not seeming to advance. There we go. And then kind of the last thought about this, about why Delhi growing here is around the 1850s, um, there's a lot of literature and there's a movement to think about how the environment can be restorative to people, especially in urban situations. We have the start of Central Park, for example. Um, and in the early postcards from Delhi, it's really marketed as, and it's probably a little bit hard to see on your screen, but I put it in large there um, on the left, the garden spot of the Catskills. This idea that the environment, not only um, kind of the resources, but the environment was a, a garden, someplace that's cultivated and cared for and that can be enriching to people. And I think this continues to be a factor today. Um, we have a number of like second homeowners in, in the village as well. So, you know, there's probably other things we can think about too, but just conceptually, this might help explain some of the growth early on in this area. So we're gonna start at the college and then we'll start to walk down the main street, as I said. So this is a good little trivia that probably many of you know as alumni, um, in what year was the college founded? So 19. 13, oh good, we have an audience and one member participating um, in, in the live room here. Uh, Dr. Franks knew the answer to that, um, so 1913. And I just wanted to start there. Um, some of the research I've done has been about uh, Elizabeth and Amelia McDonald, um, which were some of the, two of the women that were responsible for some of the foundation of the concept for this college. Um, and they also, especially Amelia, was very active in women's rights um, and the women's rights movement, um, as well as Mrs. Cannon that's in this picture here. And we'll be talking about the Cannon family a little bit later um, as well. And, um, you know, they had to put forward this idea a couple of times that uh, it was rejected in 1910, 1911, and 1912. But by 1913, Governor Seltzer signed the bill that um, put Delhi. Delhi um, into play it was the Delhi State School of Agriculture and Domestic Science. Um, and the announcement was made in this beautiful building, this opera house that no longer um, is standing. Um, it's approximately in this region and of the photograph you see on the lower right. Um, so this opera house uh, was built. Um, it was in place by 1884. Uh, it later became um, Smalley's and a movie theater. Uh, and by the 1990s, um, the towers that you see, the tops were truncated, and then the structure was removed um, around 1990, um, circa 1990. And this is just a view of the interior um, of that structure. And that's located um, sort of off of um, Kingston Street here. And then if we just kind of look at the evolution of the campus, um, there are many, many changes and we could spend the whole talk just um, looking at the architecture of the campus, which we're not gonna do, we're gonna kind of jump into the village here. Um, but I just wanted to start at this point. Um, and initially there were um, a couple of structures on the campus that were historically associated with Delaware Academy, the high school. So there was the Academy building that you see here that dates to circa 1856 that has a lot of classical detailing and we'll look more at classical detailing as we go. Um, and then there was a boarding house as well as um, this brick building um, that was built and they were sort of in this region on this plan view of the college. Um, eventually this building um, transferred to the college and it was torn down around 1977. 
and these buildings are no longer on the campus. But does anybody know the oldest building remaining on campus? Some of you may know the answer to this. Farnsworth. I'm sorry? Farnsworth. So Farnsworth is definitely, um, you know, an older one. And sometimes the names of these buildings have changed over time. And I was talking to Dr. Franks about that. So maybe this building was once called, not Dr. Okay, <laughs> was once called that. But um, according to the records I have, the oldest one was the Dairy Building, which also today is called Thurston Hall. And I put the picture up here. Um, and today it's being used for some maintenance as well as architecture offices are in this structure. I'm very pleased that it's still standing on our campus. Um, in the back, there was a uh, platform that was used for a dairy processing. It contained the library for the college for a while. Um, and it was built in 1915, um, February 1915 is that the date that I have for the structure by an LAR state architect. Um, it has kind of a gambrel roof that you can see here, some dormers through the roof, and then um, at the door, some kind of classical detailing with a uh, transom window as well as side lights, windows on both sides of the door. And you can see that here. Um, so that's just a little smidgen about the college. And again, we're gonna start walking down Main Street now, starting close to the college and then moving away, um, away from the college on our, on our walk. So the first um, building we're coming to, and I kind of have a little key down here as we walk along so you can see where we're going. Um, this one is a, a beautiful um, kind of Victorian cottage home. Um, and what's fascinating about this one, and I suspect there are many more like this in Delhi that I'd love to research um, as we go, is that in this period of the late 1800s, it was really fashionable to purchase plans and pattern books of architecture and then select your design from that pattern book and then have it constructed. Um, sometimes that happened through kits, but in this case, um, in these barber houses, they were built locally based upon the patterns. Um, and so this structure that we're looking at is there's a book of all these um, or patterns. Again, you can order this catalog and get all these designs and then choose which one you wanted. You could have modifications made as well for a charge um, and then be built locally. Um, so the author of this particular um, uh, design was a person named George F. Barber. Uh, he was based in Illinois and then later, he, sorry, he was born in Illinois and then later um, worked in primarily out of Tennessee. Um, and there are a number of his houses, I believe in Delhi. This is just one of them. Um, so this plan, if we open it up here, you can see um, this plan and the design for this structure. Um, it, the price for this uh, back in the late 1800s here, if it was built in brick, was $4,147 was the estimated cost for this home. Um, you could, again, in this case, it was built in timber. Um, so you could imagine the modification um, to that cost as well. Um, a couple of changes you notice from the design. I got to get my cursor. It's being funny here. Um, there was a keyhole window here. You can see this here in historical images that was in fact on the facade of this building. Um, the, you know, under this oriel window, there was that keyhole window, and the porch was once a little bit larger as well. Um, and the prior owner found evidence of that keyhole window when he did some renovations in the house um, as well. So this was, uh, you know, one way that houses were constructed in this period of time is through these pattern books. Um, moving along, we're kind of moving down Main Street and we're kind of taking a little detour onto Clinton Street here. There's a really beautiful church that's on the National Register of Historic Places um, called the First uh, Presbyterian Church um, on Clinton Street. Uh, historically, this um, this organization um, started around 1804 in the community. It met initially at a different church called the Old Flats First Church. And then this beautiful building was built um, in 1880. Uh, it's about, originally it was 85 feet by 59 feet, and it was designed by a very well-known architect named Isaac Gale Perry. Um, we're very fortunate to have two of Perry's works um, in Delhi. I'll show you the other one in a little bit here. Um, it was built by A.M. and J.L. Meeker and George A. Sturgis. Um, and Perry is really well known. Um, most of his works that are standing and celebrated are masonry. 
Um, but again, this one's built in timber, um, which makes it even more unique. Um, so he was the designer of the state capitol in Albany. He also designed the New York State Inebriate Asylum in Binghamton and other kind of major works like that. Um, and when you look at it, it uses a lot of, it's a Victorian Gothic, it uses Gothic detailing, it has stained glass windows, a very tall uh, tower um, spire here, and some of these uh, three-part wooden designs called trefoil designs um, are prominent on the outside as well. Um, and another kind of neat thing about this is if you look at it from the front, this picture is kind of shot from the side, it has a three-part facade. Um, and that isn't accidental. So a lot of times structures use numerical symbolism. So the number three was intentionally selected as a design pattern um, symbolizing, for example, the idea of the Trinity um, or ideas that were important to the, the faith of that group. So we see three-part designs very common um, in, in church architecture. Um, moving along, and uh, in this case, we've kind of progressed down Main Street and off of Main Street, um, on Main Street's the Cannon House, and behind that is the Cannon Free Library. Um, and the Cannon family, as well as the Sheldon family that I'll be talking about, they really were um, wonderful, uh, generous families for our community. They did a lot of um, donations to benefit the community. Um, Henry White Cannon was the president of Chase National Bank in New York City, and Jenny Curtis Cannon was the vice president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, so again, she was kind of an active, active um, suffragette, and they gifted this Cannon Free Library to the community in 1917 um, in memory of their parents. When it opened in 1918, it had 4,000 books. And um, the last time I checked the website, it has over 21,000 volumes of, uh, in it today. Um, and the family has also expanded it over time to add the children's wing um, in, in the back of the building. Um, this particular work was um, designed by Bradley Del Hante, um, who is a Cornell graduate and was built by W.S. Fritz uh, Randolph. It has beautiful marble detailing from the Vermont Marble Company um, out of New York City and steel from Brooklyn um, used in the design. It has sort of the cupola up above with some copper detailing um, and again, marble and key locations um, with above the rounded windows and the stairs. Um, and again, a nice family and some side lights uh, around the door here. Um, the family also gifted money to fund the hospital that was at that point on Franklin Street um, to bring it out of debt and to upgrade it. Um, and so, and they also donated a, a park space on the corner of um, Franklin Street and Main Street. So they were very generous to this community. Um, and I just wanted to stop there. And just to kind of talk about a little bit how some of these structures have been removed over time, but some of them continue to be, you know, really important part of our history in Delhi. Um, in 2019, this plaque that you see up here was placed to mark this on the literary landmark register um, because Jean Craighead George wrote My Side of the Mountain and one of the characters does research in the Delhi Library. Um, so the site has this plaque um, kind of commemorating this local author and this um, particular library as well. So we're going to kind of keep moving down along Main Street now. Um, and the next question for you to think about or guess at is how many hotels once were built along Main Street? Is anybody putting anything in the chat or should I just... I, we can kind of just guess in our minds. <laughs> so there were four, um, and uh, I have pictures of them up here. Um, so there was the Kingston Hotel, Kingston House, uh, and then the American House, the Edgerton House, and then the last one here, um, the Central House. And they had changed names over time. Um, and today, the only one standing is the Central House, um, which has law offices in it um, today. Um, so the other three, um, this one was lost to a fire and some were removed over time. So the Kingston House, um, we have that image over here from a postcard, and this is what's there today. There was a grocery store and a drug store. Um, today, the family dollar is in that site where this Kingston House once stood. Um, and, you know, th to think back in time, right, people were coming here for 
um, the courthouse, they were coming here to sell goods, and they, lodging was really important, especially prior to automobiles, um, where you needed to stay stay over for a bit um, in your, uh, you know, to be successful as a merchant or um, for business. And so the hotels are a really important part of the community. Um, and this one, uh, the Kingston House has classical details. We're going to see a lot of classical details. So we've got Tuscan columns here. We've got um, the triglyphs and the frieze. We have a gable end with a pediment um, underneath. And then we have dormers kind of poking through up above and some wooden sunburst designs above the main doorways here. Um, so beautiful work um, that unfortunately is, is, is no longer um, standing today. Um, it was dem demolished around 1958, um, that, that prior work we were just looking at. Uh, this work, the Sheldon estate, the Sheldon family was also very generous. Edwin Sheldon was a Chicago lawyer and involved in real estate um, in the Chicago area. And Louisa Whitehouse was his wife. Um, they designed this home. Um, they had this home designed um, probably by um, Burling Whitehouse of Chicago. Um, and it was designed in a Victorian shingle style. Um, so there's, you can see really great, beautiful woodwork going on. There were shingle shingles that were fish scale designs, turrets, um, prominent, uh, prominent brick chimneys and um, masonry foundation, a port cachere over here, a carport, um, and a lot of other really beautiful um, detailing in the shingle style. Um, it was a pretty big house. It had this solarium here with all these windows to get good sun exposure, which is really a wonderful thing in the chilly winters of, of Delhi, for example. Um, but it had 10 bedrooms and six bathrooms and a 15 car garage and nine horse stalls. So really um, massive um, estate. Um, and that was located up in this region of the map. Um, and uh, in 1937, uh, there was a failed sale to Herbert Clark in New Jersey. And in 1938, this um, estate was cleared and it was then turned into the Delaware Academy um, building um, that we have today. And so that was um, started construction in 1939. Um, moving back along Main Street, we also see a lot of uh, of uh, Italianate design styles like you see here, um, where you have a big kind of cornice with heavy bracketing below, often rounded windows. And then the first floor has big windows to kind of celebrate all the merchandise. Um, this is Stewart's store. They did a really nice job remodeling this fairly recently um, and um, kind of fixing the interior space um, to celebrate the history of this structure. And this was located here next to that one of those main hotels, the Egerton Hotel. And legend has it that historically the hotel had a connection to the upper floor, the second story, and there's a wooden floor. And if you go up there, the whole floor sways. Um, and it was designed to do that. There was a dance space, a ball, ballroom space up there um, historically. Makes me nervous going up there now because there's all kinds of glassware and the whole floor sort of moves and when I take my children I'm like especially when they were young I'm like do not run <laughs> walk through this space um, and so we're going to head now to kind of a kind of heart of the village is the courthouse square and some of the buildings around that um, and the courthouse square is designated the whole square area is designated on the National Register of Historic Places and there is a um, structure here um, that we're going to look at first, which is, um, it was historically the Methodist Episcopal Church um, in 1839 that was uh, started to be organized. And in 1840, the land was deeded um, for this church to be constructed here. And it was built by volunteers with wood from Hiram Hunt. Um, and in 1843, it was dedicated. Uh, again, Gothic influences with the pointed stained glass windows, the crenellation here, and historically in images, there were a lot of pinnacles or pointy things on the central tower, which are no longer there. Also historically, the main entrance was at the second story, and there were stairs going up to that second story, um, and they were removed um, over time. Um, so some edits um, to the structure, uh, but a really beautiful structure um, 
uh, in the Gothic revival um, style. Again, we have the quatrefoil and um, trefoil kind of detailing in the pointed windows um, on this structure. And then next to that, we have a smaller building. I can't get my cursor to work sometimes. Here it is, um, the post office building here. Uh, this was designed in 1938 for $85,000. So if we just think back to that first slide where the brick home, right, not a public building, but a home was built for about $4,000. This one in 1938 was built for $85,000. The designer was Louis Simon, um, the architect, and it has kind of a, a small cupola there and some classical detailing near the doors, um, and it's built in the colonial revival style. Um, and inside a really beautiful mural. Um, this was painted by Mary Early, uh, who was an artist from the Art Students League in New York City, who studied frescoes in Italy and in Mexico. Um, and then she won a competition to design this mural um, for this post office. And um, this you know, shows a story about the down rent wars that happened in this area where farmers started to sort of protest the um, taxes that are the things they had to pay to the landowners. Um, and so this sort of depicts the scene um, from that event that happened in this region. Um, this is one of about a thousand murals remaining in post offices uh, around the United States that were created in this period of time um, and, and were funded by the US Department of Treasury section of painting and sculpture. We could spend a lot of time talking about the downward rent war um, events too, but we're gonna keep moving because I got a couple more I wanna get to and then I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, so we're looking now at the village hall and the police office is located in here too. Um, and this particular, um, building has a really interesting history. It was actually moved. It was the second county courthouse and it was on the courthouse square and it was moved. Um, and so initially it served as a courthouse. There were important trials there from the anti-rent wars and 242 indictments were um, handed down in this structure. Um, again, it has classical detailing. This is what it looked like when it was on the courthouse square. Um, it has an impediment, it had a cupola, it had big columns on the front of the structure. Um, and then uh, eventually it was deemed too small and not suitable for the courthouse. And so somebody, um, Palmer, a person named Jay Palmer Esquire, bid $605 for it. And it was moved in 1869 by Byron Virgin and R. Murray. Um, the cupola was removed and it was raised up. Um, on a bigger foundation, and you can see that here. And in 1871, it was sort of dedicated and um, used as uh, the village hall and also the fire um, department. And um, there's a little dedication stone. And in the tower, if I just go back, in this big tower that you see here, there's a bell up there from um, West Troy that's dedicated to the fire department. And I think I've climbed up there. And when it was um, used for the fire department, there are um, pegs in that tower and they would hang their cloth, their canvas uh, hoses up to dry in the tower um, that you see there. Um, and that brings us to the third courthouse building, which is still standing here um, and is kind of the gem of the courthouse square, one of the gems of the courthouse square. Um, so this particular third courthouse that you see uh, on the right here, I'm going to get my cursor working, um, is built in the second empire style and was built by that famous architect I told you about earlier named Isaac Gale Perry. Um, and Robert Murray was the superintendent that helped with the construction of the project. Um, of interest is that it used some local materials in the construction of this um, of the structure. So the bricks are said to have been um, formed in Walton and made in Walton. And some of the stone was quarried, they believe, out of the Bell Hill Quarry um, in Delhi. So a lot of kind of use of local materials. Um, it has a polychromatic mansard roof up there get my cursor working. It has rounded arches as well as some pointed arches, uh, a lot of beautiful detailing um, at the top piece. And then it has Sir Liana or Palladian um, motif windows, which are rounded windows with two square windows on either side on all four sides of the tower. Um, and the students working on this um, 
thought about that and talked about that as the idea of justice kind of going in all directions from this building um, uh, in terms of what the symbolism of that particular detail may be. Um, the building has been restored and renovated a number of times um, over its lengthy history. Um, and another structure on the square to kind of look at is uh, this particular work, the United Ministry. Um, and the United Ministry was originally the second Presbyterian church in 1831. Um, this church was built in 1832 um, by Charles Hathaway was the designer. Um, who was a judge and also a designer of architecture. Um, and it was originally 40 by 60 feet and built by John Hunt. Um, local lumber was used. There's stories of the lumber being pulled by an ox cart to the site. Again, classical details with the important tower with clocks that were dedicated in 1917 um, in memory of the Titus Benjamin Miggs family and ionic columns down here, a broken pediment and other um, kind of classical details, stained glass windows. And one window that was moved from the um, earlier Methodist church, when the Methodist and the Second Presbyterian Church merged in 1976, one of the stained glass windows was moved and put into this building, um, kind of symbolizing the unification of those two church entities um, at the time. And the bank, the National Delaware National Bank uh, of Delhi, also uses classical details, right? We've got the pediment up here, and we have the dentals, Corinthian columns, pilasters um, on the side. And um, this particular building was built um, in uh, 1841. Um, it became located here. The designer, again, was Charles Hathaway. And um, some interesting things about this particular building is, um, according to the website, it's the oldest bank um, co-op and corporation, oldest corporation in Delhi. It's the third oldest bank in New York State. Um, so it's kind of a significant um, establishment. And in 1858, there was a robbery here. And the stu students always like um, learning about the robbery. Apparently $38,000 was stole, stolen, which was a large sum in that time period. Uh, apparently the robbers cut a hole through the floor and so when workers arrived, the safe appeared to be fine. They didn't realize it had been robbed um, and they offered a $3,000 award, but the people that did the robbery were never, um, never caught. So a little legend and story that goes along with this particular building. Um, and why do you think there are so many classically inspired buildings around Delhi and, and other communities as well? So in by classical, um, I mean, we're borrowing from ancient Greece and Rome. Um, and so, you know, it's really beautiful, symmetrical style. It's kind of graceful. Um, so there are aesthetic reasons, but also symbolically, we think about the origin of democracy um, and we think about Athens, ancient Athens and Greece and the Roman Republic period. Uh, and that sort of inspired um, early Americans and the design thinking kind of tied to those regions as well. And the last stop I want to get to, and then we'll kind of open it up for any questions that you may have, is St. John's Episcopal Church. Um, this is also in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the organization um, was founded in 1819. Um, in 1831, a wooden frame church that you see in this postcard was built, um, designed by Charles Hathaway and John Hunt. And then in 1887 to 88, um, Mr. Sheldon that we spoke about earlier, he had this chapel added on in memory of his parents and that's using a Romanesque um, revival style. Um, and then there was a fire in 1935 and this wooden structure burnt to, um, and it was pieces could be saved, but it was deemed it, it could not be saved in its entirety. And then we had this Gothic edition put up um, circa 1936, Norman Sturgis out of Albany um, designed this piece of this building. Um, and so this building sort of tells a story of a continuation of pieces that are historical, pieces that have been lost, and then pieces that have been rebuilt over time 
Um, and it's all kind of transcribed in the dedication block um, as you go in the doorway. And inside, and I wish I had a picture of this, there are the most magnificent um, teaching terracotta teaching tiles in this um, chapel that were gifted by the Sheldons that have all kinds of um, botanical details and symbol, symbolic details like butterflies symbolizing um, the idea of um, the afterlife renewal, um, resurrection, um, those kinds of ideas inside the structure. So with that, um, we're going to end because I want to see what questions you have and, you know, I encourage us all to kind of think about what will the college look like in 2121 and just saying the number 2121 um, sounds interesting <laughs> and um, what will the village look like in 2121. Right? Um, and so we have a little ad here for the college that $100 should pay all necessary expenses for the entire term. Um, so it kind of makes me think about that a little bit. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the alumni day. And I really hope in the future, um, you know, I might meet some of you all in person. I'm just going to put in the chat my email because I forgot to show you that slide at a reference slide for some of the images and um, my email. So if you ever want to share any other memories you have about particular buildings, or if there's buildings you think would be really good for students to research, please send me an email. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to discuss that with you. Thank you all. <laughs>